Records. How can I make one? What about songs? They're hard to write. What's a label? My cousin's in a band. I want to be in one someday. But how? Hi, everybody. I'm Bill Boggs, and I welcome all of you to What's Up? Well, thank you very much, kids. Hello, this is a special edition of What's Up, coming to you on location from Center Grove Elementary School in Randolph, New Jersey. I'm sure most of you kids here in the audience and folks at home are actually wondering what this giant record player is all about. Well, on today's show, we're going to be learning about Matador, one of the best record labels around. And you're going to get the chance to meet up close some of this company's top recording stars, such as John Spencer of the John Spencer Blues Explosion, Liz Fair, Yo La Tengo, Railroad Jerk. As a matter of fact, why don't we get right to our first music video right now? Wait a second, who's that? Oh, hi, hey everybody, it's Mr. Bull. How you doing, Mr. Bull? What's that? No, I haven't forgot. He thought I forgot about him. I haven't forgotten about you. I have an idea. Why don't you just basically go and see if you can find your friend, the Matador, and we'll get back to you a little bit later in the show, okay? All right, good. But right now, this is a clip from Matador's latest sensation. Here is Spoon. Okay, now here's a question for you kids. When you want to learn about somebody, who do you ask? Hmm? Well, one good answer would be an old friend, obviously. So when I wanted to find out more about Matador, who could I turn to? None other than the railroad jerk, and they've been with Matador from the start. Let me introduce you to Marcellus Hall and Dave Varenka. This is the story of Matador. I know I can, I will. Once upon a time, Matador was not the large and powerful record company that we know it to be today. At one time, Matador was just a dream, just a word on the lips of a young man living in the New York City. That man was Chris Lombardi. I'm going to have a record company, Chris would say to his friends. Stop lying, they said. Yeah, shut up, they said. But I will, Chris muttered to himself as he walked away. I will. Early on, Chris signed promising unknown bands such as H.P. Zinker, The Dust Devils, Teenage Fan Club, and Railroad Jerk to his label. Times were hard, and in those days, there was no Matador office. Chris went from town to town, selling his records from the back of his father's Volvo, sometimes even skipping lunch during the long hours. People laughed at him. They said it wouldn't work. It will work, Chris thought to himself. It will. And work it did. Soon, the orders began coming in. Chris got himself a little office at 611 Broadway. There was no running water, and there were rats as big as a seven-inch vinyl single, but it didn't matter. Chris's dream of having a record company was coming true. By and by, Chris realized he needed a partner to help him and become the focus of all the press attention. Along came a young man named Gerard Cosloy, wearing a baseball hat. Gerard had always had a dream, and that was to be part owner of a record company and to defend the purity and quality of music. Like Chris, his friends too laughed at him. It'll never happen, they said. You'll always be a total loser. And they went back to their journey in Ario Speedwagon. It will happen, said Gerard. It will. And it did. Well, now we know a little bit about how the Matador Record Company got started as a dream to two bright-eyed, bushy-tailed young adults. So in the minutes ahead, let's take a look at the music. Now, if you were going to start your own band, 
What is the first thing that you would need? Okay, let me take some. Okay, now besides your voice, you would need instruments. And of course, there are all kinds of instruments. There's the bass, the drums, the piano, the violin, the harmonica. Is there something I'm forgetting here? Yeah, that's right, the guitar. So let's talk about the guitar. Let's see, the guitar. Oh, wait, I know exactly what to do. Yeah, what's up, Ivor? What are you doing? Oh, just playing a little. Well, it sounds good, but I thought we'd talk a little bit about the guitars. And this is a beautiful guitar. It's got the beauty of an old guitar. Is this the first guitar you ever had? It is. I got it, uh, some guy who was going away to college and I bet he regrets that he regrets getting rid of his guitar. Well, as an electric guitar like this, you have to have, a, obviously, to hear it, you have to have an amplifier. Tell us about the amp that you're working with today. Uh, the Fender Champ. Uh-huh. Um, it's not the loudest amplifier on the market. No, it's right. like a practice amp. That's right. How about, the, how about these things down here? What are they? Uh, just different pedals, change the sound. Uh, you know, before it gets the amp, this is the, uh, the echo. This is a uh, the Rat, popular fuzz box. Adds a little like a little distortion to the mm -hmm. sound. Yep. Exactly. How about this one has equalizer written yeah, on it? Yeah, that, that? that it means you can change the tone, or you can also just it helps just for like if you're gonna play a solo and you want to get a little louder. You can the, um, All right, everybody, let's uh, listen to and watch Yo La Tango. All right, now let's see. If you've got a band with some top shelf equipment and you know how to use it, the next step is to write some songs. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Well, it actually is. In fact, anyone can do it. For example, have you ever found yourself walking home from school and you're just kind of humming a little tune to yourself? Well, all you have to do is to put that little tune to a little music and boom, you've got what we call indie rock. And that is rock and roll for independent people like you and like me. It's easy. And then, of course, once the songs are written, some people go into a very big recording studio and there they've got all these microphones and they hook them up to a giant tape recorder bigger than you could possibly imagine. And they record those songs, one by one, instrument by instrument. Now, for some people, working with professionals at a recording studio is like working with the big leaguers. For others, such as matador recording artists guided by voices, Nothing can match the intensity of recording the instant a song is actually written. They say that you can then feel it in the track. To capture that spontaneity, they record in their own home. Sound exciting? Take a look. Well, here I am sitting in the middle of a giant LP. Do you kids know what LP means? No. Okay, I will explain. LP means long player or long playing. It is a record or an album. Now, you're probably much more familiar with compact discs, correct? Yeah. Or cassettes like that giant cassette over there. Anyway, I'm sitting here wondering to myself, how does a record actually get made? Now, this one, the one I'm sitting on, is actually made of carpet and wood and a little bit of plastic in the center. But just like an actual 12-inch record, it started with an idea in someone's head, and then it, it got made. All of the different elements came together to form something that was bigger than the sum of their parts. So right now, it's time to introduce you to another friend of mine, and we will show you how the elements of rock, songs, instruments, recording, and matador all come together to become a record. A rock band? Everybody's got one. Man, it's the fastest growing sport in America. But you know what? It's not as easy to get one going as it seems. First things first, 
Get a job that lets you do what you need to do. Like putting up flyers. If you're starting a band, you need to get the word out. Don't forget you can't be too clever. Next, auditions. Be ruthless. See who's got the look and who doesn't. Especially who doesn't. Then once you got the four people that can at least pretend they're friends, you're on your way. Now comes the hard part. You gotta write songs. Well, just do your best. Who knows? Maybe they'll be good. And as soon as you can, throw it all in what's called the demo tape. And make the scene. Make yourself known. Because unless you're waiting for some act of God, you gotta know who's who. You know what I'm saying. And they gotta know you. Then you take that tape, say a prayer, and hope the big boys upstairs like it. Next thing you know, you're signing a record company contract, take impress photos, recording an album for real. But once you got that album on tape, then what happens? Well, the band gives us a uh, 15 IPS half-track analog master tape in most instances, which looks something like this. This needs to be sent to a place called Mastering Lab, which is where tapes are prepared to be made into records, essentially through a process of equalization. They use a machine called a Scully lathe, which is essentially a record player, a turntable in reverse. A hot needle cuts directly into cellulose acetate to produce a, uh, something we call an, a reference acetate. It's something like this. It's made out of a cold, smelly, constantly decaying substance, very cheap to cut into, and we can use this to hear what the record's going to sound like. Subject to the band's approval, we send this back to the mastering lab, and they prepare a second acetate. This one goes directly into cold storage and is shipped overnight to the pressing plant. At the pressing plant, it, where it is now referred to as not an acetate but a master lacquer, it is electroplated with metal, which is sprayed on, and uh, it's a nickel alloy, and this is the master lacquer. This is what it looks like. Now, from here, there's two routes that are possible. This uh, can be used to make records directly. This is a negative image of the record. You press this into vinyl, and you get records. And that's this is called a metal mother in that case. Otherwise, you can peel the metal back from the acetate, which forms a metal master, which is used to make a metal mother, which is used to make stampers, which are used to make records. An alternative process is to order copper positives directly from the mastering lab, where they make the metal at the mastering lab, and this is a positive image of the record. You could actually play this on your record player, um, and this is your reference acetate, and then this is also used as your master. This is used to make stampers, which are used to make records, and that's called direct metal mastering. And that's about it. Thanks. After all that, there it is, your debut album. Pretty, huh? But even then, even when the record's in your very own hands, Remember the most important thing of all, don't quit your day job. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the Matador of Matador. <laughs> Well, good, Mr. Matador. You certainly look Matadorish, <laughs> I, I would say, today. Uh, tell us a little bit from your perspective about what it's like to see a record get made. About the groups, Mr. Matador? Sir? Mr. Matador? Mr. Matador? Sir? Yeah. 
We got kids here watching. We're talking oh, about sorry. those groups that record at home in their own homes. What, what's, what's, what's going on? Uh, nothing. I, I, I'm, I, 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 I gotta go. Talk about abrupt exits. Check this clip out. This is Silkworm. Now, making a record is not just about making music. You can't forget about the artwork, and that includes everything from a cover to a poster to an ad that you might see in a magazine. Now, it sounds like a lot of work. Maybe, maybe not, but I'll show you. Hey, Marco, how you doing? What are you up to? Hey, Bill, I'm fine, thank you. I'm working on some designs for some Matador record covers. Well, that makes perfect sense because Marco is the art director for Matador. Marco, how, uh, tell folks how a record cover actually begins. Well. A lot of times I start with some old magazines. Maybe get some magazines from the 60s, 50s, science magazines possibly. Also, Polaroids are great to use. Don't be afraid to use a lot of Polaroids. Whiteout's great. <laughs> Put a lot of whiteout all over them. It is, now, is, is that essentially apply for a poster as well, Marco? It really does, except the posters are just much larger. Larger versions of record covers. Exactly. Uh, of CD covers. Okay, what would you say in the whole history of Matador is the best cover Matador has ever had? Mm, I'll tell you, Bill. Let me take care of that right now. Girls, you want to give me a hand with this? Oh, good. Oh, I see why you're good. You, you work with helpers. Exactly. Girls, let's go. And while we're waiting for that, here's a band that put a spell on the folks at Matador all the way from Holland. Here is Betty Serviert. Well, this is actually uh, harder than it looks, but it is fun trying to come up with your own record cover. And don't forget, there's so much more to come up here on What's Up Matador. Clips from John Spencer Blue's explosion and helium are on the way. And actually, I don't want to make a big thing of it, but we're going to be talking to Liz Fair through the television in just a minute. Now, here, what do you think? No, oh, you're right. Where's Marco when you need him? Oh, here I am, oh there Bill. you are. Well, how'd you all do? We did great. We had a really good time. Well, let's see what we have. Well, we've got a couple of ideas for pavement record covers. All right, sweet revenge, pavement, right. looking good, okay. Another one, mountainous territory. Well, that's, that's hip, I like this guy here, mm -hmm. right out of a magazine mm -hmm. or something. And harmony underwater. Harmony underwater for pavement, okay. Well, they're good, I think you did a good job, but right now, here's the real thing. Well, we've been seeing all these videos today, and I guess that's actually the next step in any band's career. After you've finished your album cover, you've got to make a video for one of your songs. You actually could choose from a million ideas. So let me ask you kids, do any of you have any ideas for a music video that you would make? Where would it be set? Yeah, what, what, where would yours be? On my lawn, having fun in a sprinkler. Having fun in a sprinkler? That's good, I like that. Yeah, how about your idea? A room with what? Bursting with color. Oh, a room, a room bursting with color. I can see that. That's very, like, that's a 60s look. How about over here? Yeah. Um, jumping on a trampoline and flipping. Jumping at that, I like that idea. Jumping on a trampoline and flipping. That's something I would like to see. And you could use the music. You could be going in slow motion coming down. That's a good idea. How about over here? Any? Yeah. What's your idea? Daydreaming. Daydreaming. You mean like? What a day for a daydream. Yeah. That, I, they should have done that when they made that song. Wait a minute. What are you guys talking about? I mean, there are a lot of practical issues when you're going to make a music video. You've got to think about your treatment. You've got to outline exactly what you're going to do in your video, in your treatment. You've got to pitch that to the record company. You've got to think about the crew. Who's going to shoot? Who's the DP? Um, are you going to pay your crew? Is it exterior? Is it interior? Are you going to use HMI? Is going to use tungsten? Um, who's going to do craft service? Um, there are a lot of things you have to think about. Location is really important as well. Um, Steve, can you get me the helium video? The other thing you have to think about is budget, because Matador is precisely the kind of company that's not going to give you a lot of money to do your video. Which is why I decided to write a book about how to make a low-budget music video. It's called You Stand There, and it's coming out in the fall of 97 on Harmony Books. In this book, I outline every step of the production process. First, I talk about how to conceive of the idea and write a treatment, um, how you draft up a budget, how to fully pre-produce, what to do on a shoot when things are going badly. It's all about post-production, but why am I even talking about this? Let's just watch some of my work.
Kids, I want to ask you a couple questions, okay? What if you had to drive 500 miles to school every day? That'd be a heck of a carpool, right? Wouldn't it? And what if a different person made you breakfast every single morning? How about if the only fun, the real crazy fun you had, was buying a different nutty baseball cap at every truck stop that you stopped at? Well, that's a little bit of a sample of what it's like to travel around the country playing music, doing something called touring, being on the road. And guys, I'd like to introduce you right now to the band Run On to tell us a little bit about touring. Okay, please describe a typical road day of touring. Well, we usually wake up and uh, get some breakfast somewhere, get some coffee, then uh, drive for a few hours to whatever town we're going to next. And uh, once we get there, we uh, set up all our gear, make sure everything's working right, and then uh, a few hours after that, we play our show. Well, look, coming up, we have an exclusive interview with Liz Fair. But right now, why don't we check out a music video from our new friends here in the band Run On. Let's take a look. Well, we've seen a lot already today. We've learned about recording songs, making an album cover, touring, and even making videos. But then what? Well, if all goes well, then people begin to know who you are, and boom, you're famous. Everybody suddenly wants to talk to you. People want to write articles about you in newspapers and magazines and pamphlets. TV shows make a really big deal about your appearing on their TV shows. Sound like fun being famous? I don't know. Why don't we ask our next friend? Hey, Liz Fair, what's up? Did you always want to be famous ever since you were a little girl? Oh, sure. Sure. Liz, when you're at the mall, do people scream your name out loud? Hey, Liz Fair, what are you doing at the mall? Yes. Quite often, actually. <laughs> okay, the subject is being famous. What would you like to know about being famous, kids? Yes. Very good first question. Liz Fair, do you like signing autographs? Sometimes. Yes, sir. Do you have any privacy? Uh, that's a good one. Do you have any privacy? No. Liz, do you enjoy being in the company of your fans? No, definitely not. And yes, sir? What would you like to be famous? What? That's, that's a, the key question. Liz Fair, what's it like to be famous? Thank you, kids. Good questions. And thank you, Liz Fair. It's always a pleasure to see you here on What's Up. And right now, let's see What's Up with one of Liz Fair's latest music videos. Okay, kids, here's a quiz for you. What is the strangest musical instrument you've ever seen? Think. A harp, maybe? How about a xylophone? Do you ever see anybody play the saw? Have you? Yeah. Oh, you have. You've seen somebody play the saw. Well, look. Coming up is a guy who plays one of the weirdest instruments I've ever seen. Have you ever heard of a theremin? No. All right. Have you ever heard of mattitude? No. No, you haven't. Okay, well, you're going to learn about both right now because here is Mr. John Spencer. Hello, my name is John Spencer. I, I, have a, uh, I play in the, the John Spencer Blues Explosion, and I use a, a unique... Uh, instrument called the theremin. The, 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 the theremin has, it has a, uh, two antennas. One has a, has a curve in it, and um, um, uh, well, I, you know, I really, it's, it's something kind of technical. I'm not really sure how it works. The theremin is very easy to play. But the, but the way in which I play it is, I think, the wrong way. I mean, it's easy for me to play. I never took any theremin lessons. I just, I, I just, you know, just, I'm, so, I'm self-taught. When I use the theremin on stage, when I play the theremin, I, yes, I do have a few tricks, uh, a few kind of signature moves that I like to uh, uh, employ. When I, when I usually use a theremin during the set, um, it feels it feels good because I get to take a little break from playing guitar. It's a little rest, really, and then I know that uh, that it's only about you know five or ten minutes until we're done with the show, and I can get a drink. Whoa! Well, that was amazing, wasn't it? Absolutely. In fact, I never really knew. 
Okay, I'll hurry up. Okay, here we go with the John Spencer Blues Explosion. Well, it's time for our last clip of the show. I don't know how the time went so fast, but I hope you learned a little bit about how music is made, and I hope you learned a little bit more about the record company we like to call Matador. And uh, well, I'm sorry we didn't get to you, James Lowe, but uh, I'll tell you what, we'll play your video. How's that? Now here's the rock band Chavez. Well, until the next episode of What's Up, I'm Bill Boggs. Adios, matadors. Why, 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 why.